All right, hello. Uh, my name is Greg Kazanza. I'm a Principal Program Manager on the Windows Server Networking Team here at Microsoft. And today I'm going to be showing you some of the capabilities of our uh, software-defined networking load balancer. This is a load balancer that is uh, a new technology. It's inspired by what is currently being used in Azure today. And we're basically taking that technology and bringing it into Windows Server for all of you to use uh, with your software-defined networks. So let's get into this and show you a little bit about what we can do with it. Um, before we jump into uh, uh, what our load balancer does, let's talk a little bit about what load balancing is in general. Uh, load balancing, basically, you have a client that's going to make a request, and you want to sp spread the load of that request across multiple servers. And the load balancer is going to pick one of those servers to send each request to. So your first request may go to server one, second request will go to server two. Now, the importance of a cloud load balancer is that it needs to be aware of where these servers are so that it can put it onto the necessary network in the cloud. Uh, for example, server one and server two may belong to one tenant and may be on a virtual network that is created by the software-defined networking infrastructure, and the load balancer needs to be aware of that virtual network to make sure it can give it the right level of isolation uh, in order to send the packets to the correct server. Now, it uh, gets even more important as your load increases from your clients and you have many client requests coming in. Now your load balancer is going to distribute all of those requests uh, across all of the servers you have. And since your cloud tends to have a fairly elastic and, you know, from the tenant's point of view, uh, unlimited set of resources, you can add additional servers behind the load balancer and the load balancer will distribute that load further and further out so that your servers never become uh, the bottleneck in your operation. So let's quickly jump over to my demo environment and take a look at uh, this in action. So here in this environment, I have uh, the Microsoft SDN solution deployed. Uh, it consists of a network controller that uh, is what is used to configure the environment. The network controller is then responsible for distributing out the settings that are needed in order to do the load balancing. So it sends some settings out to the uh, what we call the load balancer MUX, which is the front end of the load balancer, uh, which is what receives the requests. Uh, it then sends some settings out to the Hyper-V hosts, which are then able to process the packets that go to the virtual machines themselves. Here you can see I have it actually up and running, and this is one of my web servers here with performance counters showing the uh, web services uh, that are running within the load balance, uh, within the web server. Here is web server one, is represented by the green bar, and web server two is represented by the blue bar. Now you see this little sawtooth pattern that's happening here. This is the health probe that the load balancer is sending out to each of these VMs uh, every 10 seconds. Uh, this is a configurable value that can be increased or decreased depending on the needs of the application. Uh, and this, this health probe is basically determining if this web server is alive because you know, one of the properties of the load balancer is to make sure that if one of your web servers goes down, it needs to stop sending traffic there uh, as quickly as possible. So this sawtooth pattern is just doing a get to the each web server and the web server is reporting healthy and it's okay. So we can now test to see that there's actual traffic going to these load balancers or to these web servers uh, by actually doing a request to my virtual IP or VIP address, uh, which is the front end single IP that uh, you make your request to, which exists in the load balancer. So here we go. So I'm gonna do a request to uh, this dot six address and I get a response back from my web server. If I time it right, you can actually see it come up on the chart below. I'll keep clicking and you can see how now it's affecting the requests that are coming in. I'm doing this at a fairly slow rate, so you're only seeing one request come in at a time. But you can see that the green and blue are both alternating and both serving these requests. I set up a unique page on each of these web servers so you can see that each web server is getting hit independently. I can increase the load here with, uh, with a little script I have that actually runs this request in a loop and you can see the traffic can pick up uh, uh, significantly. And so as these web servers were to become overloaded over time, I can add more and more of them and the load balancer would automatically uh, you know, distribute the load across all of the instances of this application. So this is just a quick example of basic load balancing. And I should mention the load balancer that we have is what we call an L4 load balancer. So it'll redistribute uh, requests to TCP ports. So in this case, I'm going to TCP port 80 and port 80 is the web server port. And then it'll just redistribute based on any request that comes into that port, it'll send to a web server. So that's basic load balancing. Now, because our load balancer is part of our software-defined networking solution, and we have control over not only the uh, MUX appliance that receives the request, but also the virtual switch where the VMs are located and can modify packets in both locations, we can actually ha do some pretty advanced uh, things here that really optimize and bring out the performance of your environment. 
So for example, if you actually look at what each of these requests look like, it consists of a request and a response. So it's not just going one way, you have data going in and then you have something else coming back out. So a traditional load balancer, you'd send the, the packet into the load balancer, you do the NAT operation after you've picked a server and then send the uh, request to that server's IP address. The server would then send its response back to the load balancer where it does a reverse NAT back to the virtual IP address and then sends it back to the client. So the client doesn't know that it actually went to uh, an individual server behind a load balancer. What we can do, because we control the virtual switch, we can do something called direct server return. Direct server return basically says that, well, your request, it has to go to where the VIP is located, but the response, because we can modify and do that reverse operation in the vSwitch, we can send the response directly from the, the Hyper-V host that's containing that server VM and send it directly to the client that made the request. This now allows, as you add more Hyper-V hosts, your, your ability to scale uh, increases you know, with each of the hosts that you've added, and your load balancer be mux becomes less of a bottleneck. Another optimization that we do takes place when the actual client that's making the request is also in the cloud behind the load balancer. Uh, in that case, you know, again, traditionally a load balancer appliance, the client would make the request to the load balancer, the server would generate a response that goes back through the load balancer into the client. But because now in this case we, we have control over the virtual switch where the request is made and the response is generated, we can actually do something that we call east-west optimization, which basically says that when the client sends its request, the first packet goes through the load balancer, which picks a server. The server then sends its response using direct server return, as I explained before, so it goes directly back to the client. But then our load balancer mux does something special. It sends a redirect packet to the vSwitch of the client machine that tells that client that on all subsequent packets, simply send it directly across from your vSwitch to the other vSwitch and directly to the server below. And now all of these subsequent packets, especially if this is a large transfer that's taking place, will completely bypass the load balancer clients and go directly from client to server. This is great for multi-tier applications where you're doing an upload to your web server and then that is then storing that blob of data into a second tier behind it. So let's go back to my demo environment. We'll see actually this in action. And so here you have the same SDN environment and I, uh, this time I'm running a distributed file server. So my distributed file server is set up, you know, typically, you know, historically you would use uh, a server role called uh, Network Load Balancer or NLB. Uh, it's a server role that's existed in Windows Server for a long time, but it's not, you know, cloud ready. It doesn't know anything about virtual networks. It requires very careful manipulation of your MAC addresses and your settings on your virtual switch or on your physical switch uh, in order to operate correctly. So in this case, we've replaced the NLB role with our uh, SDN load balancer in front of it. And so now um, you can see here that I have a share open to the virtual IP of that load balancer. So in this case here, you can see I'm going to the dot five, the share, um, and I have it actually open on two different machines. One machine is outside of the cloud, this one up top, and this machine down below is located in the cloud. And they both have the same share on the same virtual IP opened up. So now I'm going to just show you that it is the same file share. I can rename this one, renamed file, and it shows up on the other share. So they are both accessing the same set of files. Now if I copy this file from the file server to my local machine, from the machine that's outside the cloud, I'm going to make a very small request to the virtual IP to go get the file, and then I'm going to do a large transfer from the file server onto my machine, which is going to use direct server return to bypass the MUX. On the right here, you see a performance counter for the MUX that shows how much data is going through the MUX. Right now it's idle because there's no data going through it. Down below, I have the actual uh, uh, web server or uh, file servers, the distributed file servers, which are also idle because there's no um, data going on between them. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer this file from the file server to my local machine by just dragging and dropping. It's about a one gig file and you can see the file server is doing very large transfer, but the MUX is barely noticeable. You just saw a little tick up that's slowly floating by here that shows that very small request is the only thing that went through the MUX. The, the file server itself sent a very large amount of data back, but it went directly from the file server to the client. Let's go the other way. You can see now it, it actually go through the MUX. We do the large transfer now the reverse direction. Now all the data that's going into the cloud is going through the MUX and very small acknowledgements are coming back from the file server. So let's drag it back. And you'll see now the load on the MUX is picking up. You'll see about twice as much data is going through the MUX because you have it going in and back out again. 
And then you see the data is being received on the file server at the back end. So this is going to take a little bit longer because we are going through the MUX. And then the distributed file server is going to go replicate it between all the different instances of the file server on the back end. So this uh, distributed file server will take a few seconds to do that replication. Then you'll see it show up on the other machine. Now we're going to we're going to show the east-west optimization action. So now I'm going to go from my uh, my client machine that is in the cloud, and I'm going to do that same file copy. I'm going to go from uh, uh, my this client machine that's in the cloud into the file server using the same file, just renamed differently. But this time you're going to notice that even though I'm doing an upload, not only uh, is it bypassing the MUX completely, you only see that first packet go through, but you can see it goes much faster because now we're going directly from Hyper-V host to Hyper-V host. We are completely bypassing the MUX after that first packet and it makes for a very efficient uh, file transfer. And so now if you put the two together, the, the direct server return to a, to a web server and then the backend file server, which could be your blob storage, you can make a really nice uh, multi-tiered application that is extremely efficient and really scales well. Um, in your environment. So that's software load balancing in a nutshell in, uh, in uh, Windows Server 2016 as part of our software defined networking solution. Uh, I encourage you to go to the link here to find out more information about Windows Server and look for other videos and information that we have on uh, software and networking and Windows Server 2016 in general. Thanks.